Pronto? Sì, sta funzionando. So, let's restart from where we left yesterday. So let's restart from, uh, we we from where we left yesterday, that is from uh <coughs> we uh, discovered how we can turn one uh, uh, capacitor into a detector and then in into an imaging detector. So these were the steps we, we made yesterday and we understood what is a liquid argon TPC more or less. <coughs> uh, now I will uh talk, I will start from the scintillation light um, and then I will show what liquid argon TPC can do and uh, then I will show how we use this technology to detect that to try to detect dark matter uh, and we will see that that this kind of TPC uh, detect light detect light and charge both through light detection. So, for this scintillation light is relevant. So we saw yesterday that the um, interaction of particle in liquid argon produce uh, scintillation. This light is in the vacuum ultraviolet. It has a wavelength of 130, 28 nanometers. Uh, remind that the visible light starts at 400 nanometers, so it's far is a very low wavelength. It's energy energy of 10 MeV, a uh, 10 electron volt, uh, and the uh, energy, the, uh, the ionization density depends on the type of particles. Uh, we usually say that an electron produces a soft ionization, that is, the density of the ionization, the over dishes, dishes is low, it's quite low, if compared to particles like uh, uh, alphas or uh, interaction induced by neutrons, which produce nuclear recoils, which produce a, a very dense ionization. This is relevant for what we'll say we'll see later for dark matter detection. <coughs> so in liquid argon what happens? <coughs> and also in seen on the other noble liquids. Uh, the scintillation light has typically uh, has two uh, the two components. One is faster and the other one is lower. The uh, first one is a decay time of the order of nanoseconds because it's a decay decay as we saw yesterday from a, a singlet state to the ground state which is a, sing is a singlet state too so the transition is <coughs> allowed by transition rules and so it's very fast the other component is uh, much slower at the uh, uh, with the decay time of the order of microsecond for liquid argon for xenon the, the things are a little bit different uh, and the decay time is much faster, is of the order of 50 nanoseconds. And this decay is, a, due is uh, a decay from a triplet state, from the lowest lying triplet state to the ground state, which is a single state. This transition is forbidden by transition rules. We know, but we know that uh, being um, uh, forbidden by transition rule doesn't uh, mean that the transition doesn't happen. It means that it happens with very long decay times. And so the decay time is effectively is really uh, quite slow. It's of the order of 1.5 microseconds for liquid argon. Uh, how to detect this light? This is the, m the main issue, the main issues for the liquid argon. Uh, because as we saw yesterday, uh, most of the devices we use to detect light are not sensitive to this wavelength. So we need to convert. 
uh, we typically use uh, a material that is called tetraphenylbutadiene that converts vacuum ultraviolet, li vacuum ultraviolet light to visible to make it available, detectable by common photo, photo devices. Uh, there are issues for purity, also for the light. We saw that a very important uh, parameter to make a liquid argon, a TPC, liquid argon TPC work, is the purity of the liquid in terms of electronegative contaminants, that is in terms of oxygen. So the um, argon needs to be very pure, needs to be extremely pure, with, with a level of contamination in terms of oxygen at the level of PPB, part per billion. It means that for each billion atom of, ato of argon, you can allow to be one atom of oxygen. Okay? We saw that uh, the purity of the argon you buy on the market is not good enough because it is at the level of part per million. So three order of magnitude dirtier and you need to purify. Uh, for the scintillation light is more or less the same. Oxygen uh, quenches the light. Uh, how? We will see later. But uh, as I told you yesterday, the precursor of the photon is the excimer, the excited dimer of argon. Uh, and impurities tend to uh, make this excimer, uh, this excite, without emission of photons, going to the ground state without emission of photons. So you lose this photon. But it, this is not bad because we know how to purify the liquid from oxygen. So that's fine. The problem is that the nitrogen too quenches the liquid argon scintillation light. Um, and this is more annoying because the usual techniques used to purify liquid argon by oxygen are not effective for nitrogen. So if your detector is, uh, has some kind of leakage, uh, you can, uh, you can make it work, purifying argon, uh, uh, purifying by oxygen, but in the course of time, since you are not purifying nitrogen, you will accumulate the nitrogen in your detector, and in the end you will not see any kind of light. So it will stop working because you don't have any more disintillation signal. And what happens? <coughs> so this is the process. This is the process. The excited dimer collides with the nitrogen, which goes in two argon atoms ma plus nitrogen without emission of photons. Uh, the shape of the scintillation light remains exactly the same. What change is the decay times and the amplitude of the signals. So the overall effect is that the light is quenched. So that you lose a significant part of, uh, substantial part of the light depending on the level of the contamination. Uh, for example, this, uh, this is a beautiful example. One uh, is one of the experiment probably you are doing in the school, but made with liquid argon. Uh, is a spectrum of the cobalt-60, the Compton spectrum, measured with liquid argon. You see, this is pure liquid argon. As much as you contaminate it with nitrogen, it gets a shorter, shorter, shorter. It contracts because you are getting less light, right? But the energy is the same. The, you, are, you are simply losing light. Uh, so, this is what happens as a function of the contamination, you see that the quenching, th that is the amount of surviving photons is given by this point and for uh, 10 ppm you already lost, with 10 ppm on nitrogen you already lost half of the light. Uh, and this is the level of commercial nitrogen. So, uh, if you want to buy from your furnisher of <laughs> liquid argon 
liquid argon to do a TPC, you need to remember that you need to ask for a good purity also, also of nitrogen. Otherwise, it will not work another time. Uh, you need to be below 1 ppm, more or less, to make things work reasonably well. Um, as in it is interesting to see what happens by contaminating liquid argon with nitrogen. You see that this is the long comp this is a waveform of scintillation light. This is the fast co fast component that you can hardly distinguish, and this is the long decay time. If you contaminate with nitrogen, you see that the short component remains there, but you are killing. The, the the long component, uh, so the signal gets shorter. In some application, it could be even interesting to have a shorter signal, but in this case, it doesn't help. Uh, so, this is an overall an overall uh, summary of the performances of uh, a typical liquid argon TPC. So it is self-triggering. That is was one of the requirements we asked yesterday, because we 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 saw that uh, the uh, bubble chamber are very beautiful detectors that provides a fully uh, reconstruct dimensional reconstruction of uh, events. Um, uh, they that happens in their in uh, in their volume, but they are not self-triggering. What means self-triggering? They uh, a detector is self-triggering wh when he understands by himself that an interaction happened. So, for a liquid argon, TPC, this is natural. Because, as we see, there is the flash of light, for example. Uh, and then you can, you can set a threshold and say, if my signal on the, pho pho on the photon detector is higher than a certain level, okay. This is uh, this is a, a good event. Download the the the, the buffer or uh, the memory buffer on the on the disk. So this is saved event. Uh, and this clearly is a very important requirement. For example, for the Dune Dune experiment, uh, if you have uh, a proton decay, that is one of the things we we, we Dune will investigate as as you have seen in the talk uh, of Stefan, uh, the detector needs to know that some event happened in some time inside the, the, the liquid argon by himself. Uh, while in the case of bubble chamber, you had to do at a fixed time an expansion. So this is a very important requirement. Uh, so then it is continually sensitive. It, it has a very high granularity with the wire pitch that is the distance between the, the wires in the, uh, in the planes of 3 millimeters and an overall space resolution that is of the order of 1 millimeter on the plane of the wires and 150 micrometers along the, the drift direction. Uh, so we we can uh, measure with high accuracy the range of particles, the angles, the multiplicity of the events, uh, and, and we can measure with high resolution the energy deposition. Uh, and we will see uh, that we can achieve a very good electron to gamma separation. This is very important for uh, uh, neutron experiment nowadays. We will see why. Uh, and we can identify particles by means of the, the techniques of DE, DE over DX versus range. And we can uh, reconstruct the total energy of the event by integrating the charge over all the wires. Uh, so just to give you a sense on, uh, on the numbers of we are what we are talking about, of the resolution of the detector in energy, uh, for low energy events in, in the range of MEV, the resolution of the seven is of the order of 7%, 10% divided by square root of uh, the energy. While for electromagnetic shower, it is, it, it is a bit better, of the order of 3-5% divided by the energy, square root of the energy in GV. And for hadronic shower, you go 
you do a little worse with 70, 16, 20 percent divided by square root of the energy. This is to give you an idea of what we are talking about, but the then uh, any, any specific detector has its own uh, specific characteristics. So let's see what in the end we do, such a detector can do. Uh, I will show you mo mm, all the event I will show you are real events taken with uh, some liquid argon TPC. This is an event you have already seen, that is a decay of a muon into a positron. And here you see small photons. This is the induction view, and this is the collection. As you see, the signal on the, the collection is more defined. But you can see all the details. You can even see the wires. Uh, so you see the muon, the kind to electron, and somewhere you see it the fo the spot of the photons. Here is a different event. You see a count uh, plus the kind to a uh, uh, muon and the kind to a uh, positron. See the count, the kind to a muon and then to a positron. How do we know that this is a count, this is a muon? Uh, one of the techniques that is used is as I said before the technic technique of range of D A of D over D sheets versus range. Because you learned in the previous days that uh, at the end of the track, there is, uh, you, you observe, when a, a particle stops, you observe the Bragg peak. And the Bragg peak of each particle strongly depends on the ionizing density so, uh, of the particle. Uh, so if you make a plot, make a plot like, like this one, taking the D over the sheath for each wire, we know what is the energy release, is the integral of the char charge of the wire, right? We know what is dx, 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 which is the distance between wires, but corrected, we need to correct, because the track can have any kind of orientation, you need to correct by the angle the orientation of the track, okay? So you can calculate, for each, for each wire, you can calculate the d over d dx. So you make a plot of d how d over dx varies along the track by going f from the interaction point from the start, from the, uh, the going toward the starting point. And you, 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 may you can, you obtain such kind of plot, okay? with this red point. You do the same for the, for the other particle. So this is the, the end point. So you go from here back to the production point and you obtain this other point. You see that the, this is a B scatter, but you see that two populations are quite well separated. And the one is compatible with the chemo, uh, count plus and the other one with the muon. So this is how you can uh, distinguish these this particles with charge. This is the mo one of the most used techniques to, uh, to distinguish the particles. Let's go. So three-dimensional reconstruction. This is another mu the kind, mu, mu stop, mu the kind to the electron, with an emission Michel electron. In this, this is a real event. In this case, we see that there are all the three views. Yesterday, some of you asked to me why you have three planes instead of two. Uh, because in principle, you need two, two planes, x, x, y direction, to reconstruct three-dimensionally. It is done because there are some topologies of event which, um, can, uh, wi which are degenerate, let's say, which can cause problems in the reconstruction. These events are mainly events in which one, of the tra one track is parallel to, one to the wire, to the direction of one wire planes. Suppose that you have wires running in this direction. Okay? If you have a track going in the same direction, uh, it will produce a signal on one or two wires that, that 
and is very is very difficult to reconstruct. It's almost impossible to to reconstruct it uh, dimensionally because you have one point on on uh, on one on one plane. So is uh, is very challenging. So to remove this kind of degeneracies, they usually put three wear planes with three different directions so that you reduce a lot the number of degeneracy of this kind of degenerate event that you can you can have is uh, and makes also even if the event is not degenerate makes the reconstruction process faster because uh, here is not easy to reconstruct a dimensional event it's something that is very challenging here is done for a simple event but if you have very complicated event is almost impossible to reconstruct a dimensional event so we three view here you see the three view two induction view which are the two the first and the second plane and then you have the the collection view that is the most uh, with with better with be be the with the best resolution and you reconstruct three dimensionally all the all you can reconstruct three dimensionally all the event so this is uh, the total energy is very small it's 32 MeV at the range is 50 centimeter is something like this. It's a very small track. Uh, you imagine that this detector have uh, hundred of tons, thousand of tons of liquid. Uh, you are reconstructing s something like this in a unit detector is extremely uh, big. So this is another real event. This is a neutron event. So. Uh you don't need any kind of analysis to say that it, it is a new a muon neutrinos because you you know from all the lecture you have done up to now that uh, in a neutrino the, the neutrino is coming from here when a neutrino mu interacts it produces a muon and you know that the muon is one of the most penetrating particles you know that the the, mm, the, lar the largest amount of cosmic rays that reach the Earth's surface are muons, because they are very penetrating. Instead, with uh, we said of uh, of other particles like uh, uh, electrons, pions, and so on, uh, and they constitute the main background for this kind of experiment. Even underground experiment, even if you go one kilometer below Earth, two kilometers, you still will observe muons. In uh, one of the laboratory where we worked for for years, that was 1,400 meters below the rock, uh, you have a reduction factor of the moon flux of the order of one million. But if on on the surface uh, you have uh, one million of muon per square meter per hour, this is the order of mag magnitude of muons that arrive on the Earth. Is a lot. So we are traversed constantly by muons. Underground, we still have one mu muon per square meter per hour. So each detector, even underground, dark matter, can, they will detect muon. They need to take uh, some kind of precautions to, lead to uh, take into account that muons are arriving. Then they produce nuclear spallation in materials, so they produce neutrons. So it's a problem that we need to, to, to take in our, mm, in our mind. So there is the neutrino coming here, producing these muons. Mm. So this is the uh, most penetrating particle. It crosses all the detector. This is something like 10, 20 meters of track. Uh, then produces also a proton here, which produces a secondary vertex here, with the production of a kaon, if I'm not wrong, which decays into another muon, and then to an electron. Here, let's if we zoom near the vertex, you see that these two small electromagnetic showers start not from the vertex, but there are a few centimeters from the vertex to the production point of these photons because they are these are photons which produce electromagnetic magnetic showers this is a very interesting point because we know that this this particle needs to be a pi zero 
which decays in two photons, and the two photons produce the two electromagnetic shower. Okay. Uh, this is an important feature of this kind of detector because we are able to discriminate this event from gen genuine event where we have an electron coming out from the vertex. That will tell us that this, this event could be, imagine if you don't have the muon but you have only an electromagnetic shower coming out from the vertex, this means that it is a neutrino electron event. Okay. So this detector is able to distinguish this kind of event that can mess, that can be a background of neutrino electron event to genuine neutrino electron event. Imagine that if, if this muon were for some reason going out uh, from here was hidden, so we, we could not identify this like, like, a, like a muon, and we didn't have such kind of resolution here, this event was very similar to one electron neutrino event. Was not, not so easy to distinguish. And just to stay on the uh, on the piece, this is a genuine. Uh, this is a neutrino electron event, a real neutrino electron event. Uh, and you see that the neutrino is coming from the same direction. This is a beam, and the shower is produced just starting from the vertex. So this this we identify this event like an electron neutrino event. Uh, this is very important to do uh, oscillation studies. For example, these, neut mm, uh, these neutrinos are produced from a beam. Uh, were produced from a beam that at CERN, it traveled for 700 kilometers and were detected uh, with the liquid argon TPC. So, uh, neutrinos are produced uh, like new mu, uh, muon neutrinos. So, you want to understand uh, how, what is the number neutrino, uh, muon neutrino, which transformed eventually into electron neutrinos to make us to uh, perform your oscillation studies, to make comparison between how many you produce at the source and how many you detect. So it's very, it's fundamental, the, ab the capability of distinguishing uh, the, the, no the type of neutrinos. I anticipate the question, uh, probably. Uh, can we distinguish mm, tau neutrinos with such a detector? The answer is no. Or oh, it's very difficult. Because the tau decays very f in a very short uh, distance, a distance at the level of uh, millimeters, submillimeters, micro, microns. So you cannot see the track of the, the tau coming from the vertex, but you see the decay products. And this is very difficult to distinguish from background produced by other neutrino interaction. Uh, to detect no tau neutrinos, you need to build what you need, what is typically done is you need an emulsion detectors. That is, which are the detector with the highest spatial resolution which are made essentially by layers of uh, uh, photographic emulsion, like the one that were used in the old uh, cameras to take pictures. And uh, in that case, you, uh, your detector is exactly this layer of uh, photographic emulsion, and you can see the track of the tau coming from the interaction in this, in this, in, the, in such kind of detector. But with liquid angle TPC, this is not possible. Or is possible with the very, very, very low efficiency. So, what, what other detector that do uh, com comparison to to liquid iron TPC technology? These are neutrino events with the uh, water Cherenkov, super K, which you you have heard about yesterday. This is a moon neutron event that as was explained, you can distinguish from an electron neutron event because the ring is more clear uh, with respect to the, uh, to the case of electron neutrino that produce uh, 
uh, an electromagnetic shower and the Cherenkov ring is most blurred. Uh, but you, you can compare the quality of the event, the richness of information you can gain from a TPC with respect to a water sharing. Um, they're, they're really they're pretty, pretty different. So just to go inside the TPC, let's start with the first one, the, the biggest one that was produced, that is the Icarus TPC, the T600. This was up to the construction of Protodun, the biggest liquid argon TPC in the world. 600 ton of liquid argon. Uh, it, it, was, it is divided in two time projection chambers. This is one TPC. On the other side, there is another one that is identical. Uh, okay. So here is the cathode that you see is not simply a metallic plate. It, is, it, it, it has holes. It was done like this to allow light uh, going from one side to the other. So to don't, don't have a total screening of the light. The drift length, 1.5 centimeter. Uh, this, you see all these uh, tubes going all around the PC. These are uh, field shaping rings uh, because if you simply do you put two the, the, the cathode and the anode, one in front of the other, the electric field will be totally non-uniform, especially when going toward the, the, the edge of the detector. So you need to close the filter pro the, the field properly. So you put all this shaping ring all around, and you make the uh, different of the po of potential from the cathode of the to the anode slowly decreasing along this this shaping ring. So you do so you you do the best you can to have the field as much uniform as possible inside the PC, because any kind of disomogeneity, disuniformity of the field translate di directly into uh, uh, a distortion of the image. You so you need you need you need to, to do things such a way that the field is a, 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 as much constant as possible inside all the volume. Uh, then we don't need to forget that these are cryogenic detectors. So you have this huge amount of argon that is stored in underground, okay, and you need to keep it cold and in a liquid state. Uh, and you can't allow for liquid argon to, uh, to evaporate. Because you are in underground, argon is heavier than air, it goes, it makes, it um, starts stratifying on the floor, and after a few time, the, uh, all the lab is saturated with argon. And it's very, <laughs> you, you clearly, uh, don't want it happen is very dangerous uh, because you probably don't know because you one one always think that in absence of air you can keep your uh, stop breathing you can survive for two three minutes this is not true because when you go in an ambient without uh, air saturated with nitrogen what happens you breathe two times and you go down and you almost <laughs> and so <laughs> you don't have time to do anything. So you need to be very careful. You don't have time to do anything. Because you go in a place, be two times, three times, and you are down. And uh, wha what everybody tells you, for security reason, if you see something that uh, loses conscience because of uh, absence of oxygen, you need to run away. You don't need to uh, help him because otherwise you risk to to have problem with together with your friend and uh, you uh, decrease the surviving probability you have if you run to ask for help uh, your friend has better chance to survive so you need you need to be careful you can't lose any kind of amount of argon inside the tunnel and so you need to uh, everything needs to be in a closed loop so what you do? You store the liquid argon in your tank, that can be the, the, the Icarus, can be the Dune, can be the Protodune, and you keep it cold. 
you keep it cold with liquid nitrogen. Uh, so, what happens? The uh, liquid argon evaporates, you recondense it with liquefiers, which bring them, bring it again into, uh, into the liquid phase. Uh, with, uh, sorry, you liquefy with the circulation of liquid nitrogen, which re is reliquefied by uh, cryocoolers, which are machines uh, which transform, which get uh, the, the some heat from the nitrogen and bring it and keep it in the, in, the, in the liquid state. So everything is in a closed loop. Argon stays uh, in his cryostat, continuously recirculating uh, and purifying. Nitrogen cool down the, 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 the argon and the machines uh, reliquify the nitrogen for you. So you don't lose anything. Unfortunately, there are some, some, you need also to think to accident because always happens in, uh, in any, mm, it's very common. Uh, and you need to have some kind of security. So don't, don't, don't want to bore you with this because there are many. <laughs> so this is instead the protodune. So up to the construction of protodune, the Icarus was the biggest liquid argon TPC that had been surpassed by protodune, which uh, has two cryostats, each one containing more or less one kiloton, 100 tons of liquid argon, uh, built with two different technology. Uh, the, one the one, this is the single phase, which I uh, we have described to you, and this is the dual phase, which I will uh, describe to you just right now. And uh, they are at CERN on a charged particle beams. So we will study the interaction of a charged particle particles with liquid argon uh, to gain experience for the Dune experiment. They are particles with exactly the same range of the particle which is produ produced by neutrino interaction uh, in Dune. So we do it in a controlled way. So we study the same range of energy with the beam. With the beam. Uh, this is the inner of a protodune. It is constructed with a modular uh, concept. So you see these are the wire planes. Uh, they are modular. They are built in uh, this module. In, th in the case of protodune, we have six uh, of this anode plane assembly, APA three on one side and three on the other side, which are not shown. This is the cathode. And this bar here is the photon detection system. So. This is the dual phase, the dual phase technology. is exactly mo is more or less the same of the single phase, where you drift, the, the, the difference is that you drift the, 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 the charge from the bottom to the top. And uh, you extract the charge to the gas phase by applying a, 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 an electric field between a grid and uh, this module that we'll see what does. The, 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 the electrons are extracted in the gas. They are multiplied by this effect of cascade that, that is very efficient in the gas, the gas of argon inside these holes. So they, are dri they drill very small holes in such a way that the electric field inside this hole is very high, so you have uh, the amplification of the charge inside this hole, and the charge is detected by this electronic circuit, we d w which has the, 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 the advantage of having the charge, here the are this track correspond to one direction of the wires and this to another direction have the advantage that the charge is equally distributed between the two view uh, that we cannot call in induction and collection in this case, but they are both collection uh, on, the, on the two views. So we do you don't have the difference between induction and collection. The collection. They are both equally good. And the signal is bigger because you amplified with the, this, um, uh, with this module, with this um, amplification, uh, amplification system. Uh, the problem with this, the, 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 the drawback is that you need to drift the electrons for a long distance, 
so you need to have very good purity, very high electric field, and you need to be careful here where you have gas argon to di for, for discharges. So this is more or less the, the dual phase. Uh, uh, sorry, I here I put, uh, just I wanted to show to you, uh, I don't know, do, do we have a microphone so that I can... A recent uh, video that was released by the our Protodun colleagues, just to... is working? Uh, to show how big is the installation of Protodun. If, uh, so if I put on the computer, yeah, it's possible? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we make a little break. So this is the protodium. Sorry. Da provi? I, I think you are not listening. Sorry. <laughs> These are some of our colleagues that are building the I'm sorry. Uh. You have an I, uh, YouTube link said the camera. Ah, yes, probably Upload yes. Later. <laughs> okay, I will pass to you the other. So this is just to show you what how big is the installation of Produne. Uh, you see. Uh, so okay, so I will pass to you the the, the link. You you we can assist to this video. Uh, so what this is a summary of, of the uh, of all is being uh, we are doing the what has been done in the field of liquid argon TPC uh, so uh, for uh, the long baseline program that you have heard about many times this is the genealogy of prototypes that led will lead to the construction of the dune we had have, we have in 2010, 2011, uh, a first test with the, the demonstrator for purity uh, for liquid argon. Then the 35 ton, the protodune, and then the dune. Uh, on the short baseline program, we will have Icarus that we have seen operating in uh, a long baseline experiment in Italy, and that has been now uh, transported to Fermilab to, make, to be part of the short baseline program the microbone and the SBND. And the test bin experiment, from starting from this small TPC in 2007, the Argonaut of Fermila and the Lariat of Fermila. So it's a huge amount of work, a lot of people working on this time and na nowadays. It's a very hot topic in the neutrino physics today. Sorry. Uh, so. To summarize the Dune program, uh, these are the two prototype models. These are the uh, the single phase detector. This was the 35 first prototype, the protodyne Dune single phase at CERN and the, and the Dune. Uh, this for the dual phase, we have a, we have a similar similar uh, development, starting from the WA105 dual phase prototype, then the protodyne time aligned with the other protodyne. And the and the, the dune door phase design. I will skip this. I plan. I wanted to to tell you something about the uh, the photon detection system of the dune that is based on uh, a Brazilian um, idea that is the Arapuca, uh, which I will only say briefly two words, since you will be able. since you will be able to learn about the Rapuka uh, during one of the experiments that we have here, 
we have one uh, Arapuka that can be tested here. The idea is to have uh, to trap a light inside the box uh, so that you can uh, increase the detection efficiency of liquid argon scintillation light. You do this you do this by using a box which is highly reflective inside. On the top of it, you close with the filter that is a decroic filter which is HD has these properties. Is is it is trans it is tra transmissive for wavelength below a cutoff, and it is reflective on the other side. Okay. So you close this box with the, this filter, and uh, you use two wavelength shifter, one of e on each two side. Uh, the first shifter converts light in this region, where the filter is transparent, so that the light can go inside the box. When the light is inside the box, you use another shifter to convert to a wavelength around 430 nanometers where the filter is reflective. So the light enters but cannot exit. So it is like trapped. And so if the reflectivity of the surface is high, it will bunch, it can bunch many times before being detected. So you can detect the first time, then the photon, wi the photon which are not detected can be recycled, let's say by the reflections so you get you, had, you have another chance of detecting them and again you have third fourth chance because if you build a good a good box with high reflectivity this ends up in increasing the detection efficiency of the system uh, this is the was the first prototype then uh, we made a lot of tests but I don't have time to go through them this this was uh, Fermilab This was the first liquid argon test in Brazil that was done in Campinas at the Synchrotron Laboratory with uh, one of these prototypes. So and then things grow, so we built other devices. And then we instrumented a fraction of the photon detection system, Protodune. So in Protodune, we have an array of these Sarapukas that will be uh, tested together with other systems. So this is the, now we, we you see that we started with one photosensor, now we have 12. The, cell, the cell is much bigger, so the device is something that is up can work in big detectors. So we, we started from an idea of, um, with a box of 3 by 3 square centimeter, and now the detector is 2 meters by 8 centimeter. So it's made of a uh, modular way. Uh, and everything started from, uh, from uh, one idea that is being developed at Unicamp together with our group. Just, just in this last part of the lecture, I want to introduce you to the TPC which I use in the, uh, for dark matter detection. Then you will have a lecture dedicated totally to dark matter detection. So I, I will introduce this argument from the technical point of view because uh, specifically, this dual phase TPC were born like a spin off of the liquid argon TPC. In particular, the Icarus experiment invented this technology that now spread all in many other experiments uh, for dark matter detection. That we choose liquid argon and xenon, or xenon. And there are experiments that are planning to, to use both the targets, liquid argon and xenon, one close to the other, to compare the two, the two detectors. Uh, how it works. It is very similar to, to the Dune dual phase technology. You have a volume of liquid argon with, uh, which is in uh, equilibri thermal equilibrium, so you have the liquid phase and the gas phase. And you have an array, array of photomultipliers of, or other photon sensors which observe this volume. Uh, you, as you learned, from what we have said up to now, you need to apply an electric field to the liquid argon volume. You do it by applying the electric field between the cathode and a gr one grid that is just below the liquid level, okay? And the field is of the order of 
500 volt per centimeter or below. Because we learn that you, it is more or less the limit you can do because uh, the, the, the drift velocity of uh, electron in argon saturates for higher field. Then you extract the charge from the liquid to the argon by applying an electric field of the order of 3-4 kilovolt per centimeter in a very short distance. So the, the potential is small, but the field is strong. Is 400 volt, 4,000 volt per centimeter. You extract the charge to the to the gas. You accelerate this charge between the second grid that is just above the liquid, uh, the, 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 the level of the liquid inside the gas, so that you uh, you you produce this cascade, this uh, mechanism of amplification of charge. So from, from few electrons, you go to many electrons. With a gain factor, you can tune, tuning the electric field. This, this electron accelerated into the argon and multiplicating produce a scintillation signal that is detected from the photomultiplier. So you have two scintillation signals. The first one that happens when the, the interaction occurs in liquid argon. You have the interaction scintillation light according to the shape that I showed you before with two decline exponential assuming that is, this is argon okay and you extract a fraction of the charge from the interaction point so you so you detect the primary signal is scintillation light from the primary interaction on which you have the bonus of pulse shape discrimination okay then you drift the charge so you wait time of the order that you know now, I should not say, but of the order of hundreds of microseconds, uh, depending on the position of the interaction. So the time you wait between the primary and secondary signal is exactly the drift time. Okay? You we wait the drift time, you produce a secondary scintillation, and you detect this we detect the secondary light that is light produced by the charge. Is light proportional to the charge signal. Okay? The first signal is proportional to the scintillation light produced by primary interaction. You extract the charge, you drift the charge, and extract the charge to the gas. Amplify the charge, this charge Excites, excites the, the gas argon and produces a secondary light that in this, time, in this case is proportional to the amount of charge you have extracted. So the primary signal is the light, the secondary signal is the charge. So you are measuring first scintillation and charge. And position. Other bonus is the position because you have the uh, the drift time that gives the position along the drift. But you have also the position on this place with, with a certain resolution. Because this secondary signal, uh, here the, 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 draw is the drawing is, is misleading because this grid is very close to the photomultiplier. So this signal is produced very close to the photomultiplier. So the signal, the photomultiplier which are closer to the signal see more light. So you can make some kind of uh, uh, body center of the light detected by the photomultiplier with which you can reconstruct the position on this plane. Okay? You will make an, uh, a weighted average of the signal of the photomultipliers with their position and you can reconstruct the, 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 the position of the vent in this plane. What I'm saying is this thing. So you have the all these photomultipliers And assume that the interaction is here. You will see a lot of light with this, slightly less with this, few, few light with these others, and almost nothing with, this, with, this, with, the, with the other photomultipliers. So, uh, averaging the signal observed by the light sensor with that position, the position of the photomultiplier by the light they see, you can reconstruct the, the position of the, of the event in, in the, plane, the plane of the photomultiplier. So you have the three coordinates 
and the resolution is not bad depends on which which sensor you are using uh, so on the drift coordinate is very good it's like a, a tpc common tpc below millimeter on the plane of the multi photo multiplier is of the order of the centimeter so it's not so bad uh, so what do you want to, de to detect with this chamber <coughs> This chamber are designed to detect, to make direct detection of dark matter. Uh, under the hypothesis that dark matter is made by WIMPs. Uh, so I don't go much in the details because you will have a lecture on this. Uh, but the WIMPs, WIMP is a weak interacting massive particle. So uh, a particle uh, which is neutral, which is people things is heavy uh, under of GEV, GV uh, and interacts only by uh, weak interaction what we are interested in in this case is that such kind of particle if exist would produce an interaction of, uh, of the same type of, of a new neutron o o what does it mean if the WIMP interacts it is neutral it will interact with the argon nuclei uh, which will recoil the recoil of the argon nuclei will ionize the surrounding uh, or excite the surrounding argon atoms uh, in the near, in near where, where the, 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 the interaction occurs and will produce light okay uh, so uh, what is uh, very important for this kind, since this event is extremely rare and were never observed, observed, you need to be, to do all the best to discriminate the background, okay? Uh, and this, this, this technology has uh, uh, several ways for background discrimination. The first one, pulse shape discrimination, we, we saw in the, uh, in the description of a scintillation light. In the case of liquid argon, we have two components, the fast light and the, the, the slow light. We have two components. Oh. So typical scintillation signal is like this. The abundance of this component strongly depends on the particle type. For example, if it is an electron, it's something like this. If it is a neutron, it's something like this. Okay? So by detecting the shape, by measuring the shape of the signal, you know if it is an electron or a neutron. So in this way, you uh, immediately are able to discriminate the, 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 the gamma background, which produces electron interaction inside the liquid, and you can discriminate all of them with high, with down, with high power. The second way you can, you can, you, you, you can discriminate uh, particles is by comparing these two signals, the, s the, the secondary signal and the primary signal. Uh, because the amount of charge you can extract from the interaction point depends on the ionizing density. I said at the beginning that the ionizing density of, uh, of the um, electron is low. In the case of an electron, assume you have an electron and a neutron with the same energy deposition. In the case of electron, you are able to extract a much higher amount of charge with the same energy deposition. So, this means that the secondary signal for an electron will be much bigger than for a neutron. So, if you simply make the ratio between S2 secondary signal and S1, you, you gain some discrimination power between electron, the main background of this experiment, and neutron-like interactions. Uh, this is, this is a one of the detectors that are used uh, nowadays for dark matter detection, the dark side 50 detectors. You see that there are photomultipliers everywhere to increase the detection, the efficiency. The surface, the lateral surface are totally reflective, coated with the wavelength shifter that we have we're talk ab we're told about, the TPB, uh, and but the principle is exactly the same. 
but uh, last thing that before closing, uh, we know that we expect that the wind produce an interaction like a neutron. So, and the neutron. So, what we do with the neutron? <laughs> this is the problem. We need to screen uh, as much as we can. Uh, as Stefan <laughs> asked uh, today, I don't remember what do what do we do with neutron? I wish <laughs> something like this. So, the detector is this small thing. The, the inner detector, this small thing here. This tank which has a diameter of 10 meter, 11 meter, and a height of the diameter of 10 meter, height of 10 meters, is full of water to screen neut neutrons coming from the surrounding. This is an underground experiment, so neutrons coming from the rock. Uh, but this is not enough, because neutrons are produced uh, everywhere, also from the structure that uh, surrounded the detector. So. In this water tank is immersed a tank with a scintillator. This is called an active veto. So that if an electron coming from uh, outside or coming from the, 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 the structure of the, the detector or from uh, other things, from the cryostat, uh, before entering in the active volume and producing interaction, will, will, will produce with high probability other interaction in this active Vito region. So the neutron will produce a scintillation, one or more scintillation, uh, outside and inside the detector. So if you find uh, a neutron-like interaction, in light, neutron -like interaction inside the TPC, you check if you have another interaction in the Vito. If yes, the event is a neutron. If you have an interaction in the, the, the volume, active volume, and outside, this is with 100% uh, 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 probability a neutron. Uh, so uh, this is this is all just you to show what is uh, an event, an electron-like electron recoil interaction by electron gamma, and this is a neutron. They are very different. Uh, this is how they are discriminated. This is the primary signal, and this is, this is, as I told you, primary and secondary. This is the drift length. You see that with more or less the same amount of primary light, the amount of secondary light is very different. And this is the second weapon you have to fight against the background. Uh, in the case of, uh, of xenon, you don't have the pulse shape capability, because the two components are very, uh, very close one to the other. You have only S S1 over S2, S2, but the xenon is heavier than argon, so you have other advantages that we you will hear about later. So this, 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 this all, I hope you enjoyed this uh, very, very short uh, lectures. And if you have questions, uh, you can send me email, uh, whatever you want. And if you are interested in such kind of, uh, of things, you, are you want to work with us, we are very open uh, <laughs> to, to have good students with us. So we are in Tunicamp, so uh, we are available to talk with all of you. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's have one question. Hi. Uh, for dark matter detection, what is like the minimum threshold energy that you can achieve with this? Detector? With with the lightest with the latest detector is uh, very low. It's 10 keV, some 10, 15 keV. 10, 15. Okay. And for you, tell us that the quenching factor is the same for the dual phase at the single phase as you or is like different principle for quenching factor the quenching what which can quenching factor because there are many uh, many quenching factor if you uh, uh, if you, you are saying about the attenuation of the charge along the drift is the same uh, but the problem the problem the issue with the dual phase is that the electron need to drift longer distances uh, six meter instead of three or two so the charge is uh, more absorbed by the impurities. So you need you the the the, um, the purity of the liquid argon uh, needs to be better. With this, okay. but 
the signal, you, the signal to noise ratio of the dual phase is better than the single phase. In the normal condition, is ten times better. Okay, so it, okay, it helps. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And as Ettore men mentioned, there is a, an experiment with the Arapuca. So I hope many of you are able to do it. And there is another experiment with the TPC El Tepecito that I hope uh, also you guys can do.